Why to High Dub, Jolene Anderson and Squess. Hello everyone, my name is Jolene Anderson. I come to you from the Shaquatmic Nation. Um, this week's unit four is a topic is on decolonizing approaches. And this is part of the University of Victoria's, Victoria Masters of Social Work Indigenous Specialization uh, course. So the topic of this week of decolonizing approaches has guided me to see the bigger picture about how racism shows up in our everyday life and at the systemic level, which has me thinking of the different ways that racism has been presented to the public, how it's been allowed to stay intact, and how we can take action or disrupt racism to create more of a safe place to assert diversities. One thing to note when speaking about decolonization is the use of the word decolonization. To me, the word decolonizing is to not take away the truth that decolonization has happened and continues to happen, but more so that we call it out. We make the government accountable to it and we include the people that we've been colonizing in future planning for changes. This aligns with ECBOM reading, whereas the concern was that systems were completely controlled and influenced by political powers with the most finances. Because of how embedded racist values are in the daily services and programs we use, it has been made to be almost invisible and insignificant, which is how it has been presented to the public. To continue ignoring the history of colonial context is to continue preserving racist policies economic development, and overall values of society. As alluded by McGibbon, a persistent health system focuses largely on the individual rather than on societal, economic, and political context, further exacerbates health impacts. I resonate with this as a social worker working in the health field, that to focus on the immediate needs of the individual is to either access more short-term resources or provide more services and programs that meet their need. This works as a good initial response and puts out many fires on a short-term basis. But when put together with some of the larger pieces of these policies being imposed over a long period of time, especially Indigenous communities, where they have since time immemorial fought to have their own health systems and values recognized by government as more than just another service or program, but as a preventative and sustainable way to live their lives. The two do not connect. Focusing on individuals segregates, isolates, and conceals the issue rather than recognizing it as a systemic issue. When it is a shared issue, it is respected at a systemic level. But systemic issues cannot be transformed if they are hidden from society. I loved hearing this being reiterated in this week's reading by D'Angelo, where she stated, if we cannot trace the past into the present, we cannot explain current conditions in ways that are transformative rather than victim blaming. Historical struggles are not separated from the present. True reconciliation for Indigenous people cannot be changed in the same government system that has been the cause of damages done. The current federal and provincial government system has been able to create and uphold an attitude and belief system based on devastating values that Indigenous people are in superior to non-Indigenous people. They perpetuate these same values across educational, health, and child welfare systems. And these values are then built into the social fabric of knowing and being. These values have been so ingrained into the systems that the process to assimilate is barely recognizable. Even an indigenous person who grew up most of my life in an urban city, I was taught by these same systems and was socialized to believe that there was no place for an indigenous person with a different culture, value system, and beliefs, but as an Indigenous urban person, if I were to be progressive, independent, or just fit in, I could be successful and morally accepted. 
knowing what I know now about the conflict in values and impose it and <laughs> values to imposed racist policies policies sorry I'm going to start that over that thought knowing what I know now about the conflict in values to impose racist policies and the government intent to wipe out the colonial context because of the damage is done I can see the value of utilizing wise practices like the ones by Richardson in bringing wise practices to healthcare because of how it is based on using indigenous context to describe locally appropriate indigenous actions that contribute to sustainable and equitable conditions. By continuing to adhere to the same negative racist values would be the same as in a sexual abuse case, whereas the perpetrator has complete power, including funding resources and capabilities to create and uphold laws to say how healing should be seen, felt, or experienced by the victim, rather than the victim having a voice to say and share what their individual needs are to heal and feel closure. This contradicting behavior allows and enables for victims to be blamed, their experiences to be discredited, minimized to the point of non-existent, and their whole livelihood to be seen as insignificant. This is how the current government system is operating at a more systemic level, which explains how injustices like the inequalities of health care for Indigenous people can continue to com to go completely unnoticed, unvalidated, and intact for generations. The perpetrator in this case is the Canadian government who has been set up with the power and authority to, re to create the laws, policies, and public values. Overall, if we were to make changes that are really to respect and uphold decolonizing approaches, it would be to restructure the government system by utilizing Indigenous value systems. Thank you, um, Charlotte, for listening to my reflection on Unit 4, Decolonizing Approaches. I feel like I could go on a lot more about this topic now that I um, have really dug deep into the meaning of it. And um, But I must end my video here. Cook Stam, thank you. Have a good day.